Okay, so like I said, we're going to finish this session talking about complaints and allegations, which can, might be difficult, but I will stress, and I'll probably say it again later, if you need to talk about it, please talk to somebody about it. Um, so, this is an old statistic, um, but just to kind of give you an idea, from 2009 to 12, so in this three year period, on average, local authorities reported 10 to 11 allegations per year, per area, against foster carers. Now, if we get a complaint or an allegation about a foster carer, we have to look into it. We have to investigate it. Why do we have to do that? Because of this. Because sometimes it's true. Okay? Foster car carers do harm children. Foster carers have harmed children. Um, so we must consider that it might be true. Now, if you're ever in the position where a complaint or an allegation is made against you, um, you might have a, a, a really good working relationship with your fostering social worker. And it could feel really difficult, really uneasy that this social worker is talking to you um, from a viewpoint of this this might be true or uh, this foster carer can't just sit there and go I believe you. We are professionals at the end of the day and we know that in, in certain cases this has happened and a lot of the time when foster carers have harmed children it's the foster carer that would least be expected of doing so. Foster carers who've won awards, foster carers who've had constant praise for how well they're caring for children, um, but actually they've harmed children. So we must um, remain professionally curious and in the event of an allegation or complaint, we must consider that it might be true. Also, that it might not. Um, so under this statistic, 30% of those were unfounded and 43% of those were unsubstantiated. Um, and I've put at the bottom there, the vast majority of children, vast majority of children entering foster care are provided with safe placements, but in approximately 450 to 550 cases, children across the UK do experience harm each year from those people who are responsible for their care. Okay, so just as teachers and doctors can harm children, foster carers can too. So, um, so it's not that we don't like you, that we don't trust you, it's that we have to work with uh, to make sure that children are safe. Um, in 2018 to 19, across the country, 2,705 allegations of abuse were made against foster carers. 65% of these were made by children against their foster carers. So the children being looked after by the foster carer were making the allegation in the majority of cases. 58% of the allegations were of a nature of physical abuse. Of these 2,705, 57 resulted in no further action. 26% of cases the concerns were made and were referred on by whatever means, um, whatever road that went down. But 17% um, required continuous monitoring, they were unsubstantiated, we couldn't prove whether they were true or false. So the different categories that we've been talking about then are complaints, standards of care concern and allegations. So a complaint then, a complaint could be received formally or informally. Um, now if a complaint is received informally, it might be somebody, a child, a member of their family, someone anonymous, uh, someone we know, ringing the fostering team and saying, I've got this concern, I've got this, or ringing the child social worker and making their complaint. We would then come out and see you, discuss it with you and go from there. I can't tell you what will happen because it depends on the nature of the complaint and it depends on what you're saying to us and it depends on whether it's true or not. Um, if somebody makes a formal complaint, now if you've got as far as doing this training, you should have been informed of our complaints procedure by now. You should have a leaflet or some information on how to make a, com a formal complaint. We have a uh, dedicated complaints team and if someone makes a complaint to them, it sets out certain timescales that we have to investigate them. Um, 
if complaints are not resolved within a certain stage, they move up to the next stage and ultimately stage three sees us bring someone in independent of the local authority to investigate the complaint. Um, now, by complaints, um, complaints that children might make, my house is too small, um, my carers are too old, my carers are too young, um, I don't like the foster carers children, um, my foster carers make me go to football and I don't like it. So um, those kind of things. Uh, complaints from their family. Um, the foster carers aren't doing enough with my child. The foster carers aren't dressing my child properly. I've sent some clothes for my child and the foster carer never puts them in them. The foster carer's putting my child in the wrong nappies. Um, complaints that we might get from uh, other people. Um, my neighbour is a foster carer and the house is really loud and, and the kids are always running riot in the garden. Um, I've seen a foster carer, I think she's got too many children in her care. Um, I've, my neighbour is a foster carer and somebody in their house uh, was smoking in the garden. Um, so those kind of things, uh, there's lots of other examples I could give you, but th those are complaints. These are things that we need to look at and look into. Um, so a standard of care concern then is a concern raised by another professional within the child's team about the standard of your care that you're giving to that child. Now, if this was um, a concern raised by a fostering member of staff, uh, your fostering social worker, for example, then they should be addressing that there and then immediately. If it's a concern that comes in from a contact officer or the child's social worker um, or the looked after nurse or uh, a teacher at school, um, what we try to discourage is those people ringing fostering and saying you need to go out and address this. We are all professionals, we should all be able to address our own concerns with you. So we would expect that that person has raised their concern with you first and then a, a fostering social worker would still come out and discuss that with you as well. Again, I can't tell you what's going to happen because it depends on the nature of the concern and whether it's true or not. Um, my hope is that, I don't know, um, for example, because uh, it says here, the, the concern is that you're falling below the minimum standards, the national minimum standards, which is why it's important that you read and understand those national minimum standards. So just plucking an example out of thin air, um, a standard of care concern might be that you're talking negatively to a child about their family members. Um, and so I might come down and you might say, I'm really struggling um, because of the things that the family are doing to the child and the things that they're saying. So that's going to be down to us then to look at some support for you around how, how to help you work with family members. And we might do some further training around supporting contact and things like that. But we would look at how we could support that for you. Um, and equally, whatever that concern is, we're going to look at what we can do to, to help get this back on track. An allegation then. An allegation is um, an assertion from somebody that you have or may have behaved in a way that has harmed a child. Okay? You have harmed a child. Um, or we suspect you have harmed a child. If you harm a child, that is most likely to be a criminal offence. If we receive an allegation of harm against you, what will happen in the first instance is that a, a meeting will be convened and it will be chaired by what's called our ladder, our local authority designated officer. The ladder's job is to investigate, coordinate um, allegations against staff and you come under that umbrella. So the ladder will chair a meeting, which will involve the child social worker, someone from fostering, wh whoever um, we can get hold of, and the police will attend, because ultimately the, the allegation is that you have harmed a child. And then a course of action will be decided from there. So like I say, I can't tell you what that course of action will be, because it depends on the allegation, it depends on your circumstances, on the child's circumstances. What I need to tell you is that 
Our primary concern is the child's safety and we need to make sure that we are making the child safe. If there's two of you in the house, worst case scenario might be that we come and ask the person who has been alleged to have harmed the child, we ask you to leave the home until this can be investigated. Now you absolutely have the right to say no, I'm not leaving my home, in which case we would need to move the child. But in a lot of situations, it's often felt that we can look into this, hopefully resolve it, hopefully it won't be true, and uh, then we can move you back in quickly, because what we don't want to do is disrupt the child and disrupt their placement. If, it's, uh, if the child's asked to leave, then quite often we would probably move them if they're saying they don't feel safe. For those of you who have your own children, um, if an allegation is made that you have harmed a child, then um, our relevant teams will become involved to look at the safety of your own children and to determine if your own children are safe as well. Also, if you work with children, if you are employed in a job where you work with children or vulnerable adults, we may need to inform your employer while the police investigation takes place. Okay. Now, this is really difficult. Um, the reason we cover this on the training is because you need to be prepared. I have a volunteer who very, very bravely, kindly helps out on pre-approval training and very bravely shares her experience um, of when she went through an allegation and her husband had to leave the family home. And one of the things she always says is that one, it didn't put her off fostering and she's still fostering years and years later um, because the positives of fostering outweighed even this terrible thing. Um, but secondly, she said that when she did her pre-approval training many years ago, they didn't talk about allegations, uh, the risk of allegation. And so when it crept up on her, she was very unprepared and very shocked. And she feels very strongly that how important it is that you are prepared um, and we do discuss it on pre-approval training. So I think that's a really, really important message. Um, if this should happen to you, and I hope it doesn't, but if you should have an allegation made against you, these are the things that you should have in place. You should have access to an independent source of support. Now, Hull Fostering will pay for a service called FIS, uh, Fostering Information and Support Service, to come out to you and support you. Now, they can provide you with legal help um, and guidance, support, advice. You will have a named person who's your support. They can attend meetings with you. But they are there, they are independent of us. We pay, um, we pay their fee, but they are there independently to support you. Um, you are entitled to information about the nature of the allegation and who has been accused. Um, but I've put there what can be discussed may be restricted. Now, as a, if I was your social worker and I was coming out to you after an allegation, say we've had an allegation made against you, I will be restricted as to what I can discuss with you because I will be led by the police. Okay, so if the police say to me, you can't discuss this at this stage, you can only give them this information, please uh, don't think this is us being awkward. Um, we have to be guided by what they say. Um, you have the right to give your account of what has happened and you will get that opportunity. Um, you have the right to access legal advice and assistance so you can access your own independent um, services. You have the right to information around timescales and what you can expect. Um, and you have the right to, to ring people up and say, what can you tell me? Equally, information about the progress of the investigation, you can, um, you have the right to, to ask for this information and if somebody's not giving you it, to, to keep asking. Um, following an, an, uh, an allegation, if obviously if, it, if it's proven to be true, then, then measures will be taken there. But in the event that an allegation is unsubstantiated or unfounded, what will happen is at the end we will have a meeting um, to, to kind of pull everything together and look at where we go from, from here. Um, and um, you will have what's called an ad hoc review 
to look at your fostering and look at here's where we are now, where do we want to go and how can we support you, what's needed to get there. And then that review will be taken to panel and you have the right to attend the fostering panel where they will make a decision about your continued registration uh, recommendations. What feelings can allegations bring? Well, this is what foster carers say. Uh, why me? So we're talking about allegations where it's untrue. You can be left thinking, why me? And I could go on forever about reasons that children uh, make alle false allegations um, or why families make false allegations or why other people do. Um, but it can leave you feeling, why me? Why am I being punished? Uh, this can't be true. You can feel angry. That's quite a normal emotion. You can feel helpless when all this is going on around you and you know it's not true and there's nothing you can do about it but to let the, the investigation take its course. Um, you can feel um, it's not fair. You might feel guilty. Did I do enough to stop this from happening? The impact it's having on the rest of my family? Uh, what could I have done differently? Um, and a lot of people describe it like a, a bereavement uh, because a lot of the things that you feel are quite similar to feelings that bereavements uh, bring about. So how can you make your home safer then? So what we want to do is protect you as much as possible. I can't stand here and say you will never have an allegation made against you. That would be wrong of me to say that because everyone is at risk of allegation. Um, when we look at statistics, statistically you are unlikely for this to happen to you because it's only a very small percentage of foster carers that this happens to, but I can't say that won't be you. What we can do is look at what you can do to keep yourself safe. Um, no policies and procedures for investigating allegations. So in your pack, you've got some handouts, um, such as this one, protecting children, supporting foster carers, dealing with an allegation. You should also have our policies and procedures. So know, know what's out there. Uh, don't be, don't kind of shy away from this stuff. Make sure you know what's what. Keep your daily records. Daily records are really important. Where a false allegation is made, daily records can be really helpful in um, showing that. For example, it, it, it might, um, you might be recording a pattern or, or, of certain behaviours. You might um, have daily records that show that actually this child wasn't even there on the day that they were saying they were. All sorts of different things, but keep your records up to date. Um, keep your safe care policy up to date. I've talked about your safe care policy. I can't stress to you enough how important the safe care policy is. Have a strong support network. You need that strong support network around you to be able to keep your calm head while you are fostering. Equally, if you do have a complaint or an allegation made against you, you will need your support network then. Have as much information on the child as possible. If we know very little about a child, then we will be, it will be very hard to determine what triggers they have and what is going to make them feel unsafe. If we know as much as possible about that child, we can create the best environment for that child possible that will help them to feel safe. Okay, Which is why I say to brand new foster carers who are inexperienced, don't take emergencies. In emergencies, you might just get a name uh, and, and an age. If you've got lots of information about that child's experiences, what they've been through, that kind of thing, then you're going to be better equipped to provide care which apprehends their triggers, which prevents their triggers um, and creates that trusting environment. Be clear on delegated authority. So I've already talked about delegated authority a bit where I've said, uh, in the last session where I've said this is what helps you to know what decisions you can and can't make. Um, but I'm going to talk about it more in session three. But delegated authority is crucial um, in keeping you safe. And keep up to date with training. I'm not just saying that because I want you here. I'm saying that because information changes all the time. Guidance, advice changes all the time. And we update training courses with that on a regular basis. So the SPORTS uh, acronym for Safer Caring, create a secure base create uh, safety, security, stability for that child. Um, work in partnership with others. You should have your delegated authority. You should have placement plans. Uh, um, you should have all the information that is out there on this child. 
Um, openness and observation. Make sure that you're always observing the child. Make sure that you're open and honest with the child and with professionals. Um, make sure that you keep your records up to date, that you have risk assessments and they are reviewed. Um, make sure that you attend training, that you gain trust with the, that you create trust with the child and that you work with the team around the child and make sure that your safe caring plan is up to date, your support networks are in place and your sons and daughters are protected too. So this is the point where I say to the room, how are you all feeling now? Um, the challenge we've got here is you can't tell me. So I will stress again, if you're now sat there thinking, If you're sat there thinking, I've got a gazillion questions um, and I haven't been asked, able to ask Joe as we've gone along. Um, like I said at the beginning of the session, you've got a contact in fostering, you've got my email address, speak to someone, don't sit there and stew and worry, um, especially if you're a single carer, um, it's important that you talk this through with someone. If you are in the middle of your assessment, this is something you can reflect on in your assessment. Um, but I always finish this session by just saying, in all my years in fostering, um, the complaints I came across, the allegations I came across, I have never known any of my foster carers to stop fostering because of this. So even when the really, really difficult stuff has happened, foster carers have kept on fostering because they love it and because the positives outweigh the negatives and the difference we can make to these children's lives is huge. Okay, thank you for completing session two. I will see you in session three.